evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right. So, Father, we thank you for this time of coming together to be able to get into your word, Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would um, just be in us um, mm -hmm. through our teacher this evening, Lord. I pray that it will be revelatory. I pray that it will bring um, life, oh God. I pray that it, it will go mm -hmm deep into our synapses so that we can retain and remember the information father mm -hmm. and also that the holy spirit can continue to work on us even after we have departed this space together so father just be in the midst of us speak through your servant and it's in jesus name i pray amen 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 thank you so much praise god uh good evening and grace and peace to all of you Amen. Peace to you, my child. Amen. We're going to Lord willing, talk about the fellowship of suffering, the fellowship of suffering. Mm. Uh, I did write a little bit about that in our um, November newsletter. And I encourage you to look at that at your, uh, at your leisure or your convenience. We're going to start with... Um, Philippians chapter 3. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to be reading from the Amplified Bible. Philippians 3, verse 10, <clears throat> in this, so that I may know him experientially, becoming more thoroughly acquainted with him, understanding the remarkable wonders of his person more completely, and in that same way, experience the power of his resurrection, which overflows and is active in believers, and that I may share the fellowship of his sufferings by being continually conformed inwardly into his likeness, even to his death, dying as he did. And so the Apostle Paul <clears throat> talks about, you know, this, this knowing of, uh, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and that he might share in the fellowship of his sufferings. So last, last week we talked about fellowship, not just, not just um, association, but part, but but partnership, um, being a partaker, being engaged. Paul wants to be a partaker. He wants to share um, the sufferings uh, that the Lord Jesus went through. That was uh, his cry. And so, um, let me just say that you know we've been we've been called to suffer, all right? And I don't mean suffer for what the wrongs that we've done but you know that's that's, that's a that's a um that's part of our our walk with the lord jesus you know as as he suffered so shall we suffer and um and so when we're going through uh difficult times or rough times remember that jesus <clears throat> invites us So whatever we're going through is an opportunity for us to get to know Jesus in a more deeper way and uh, to know him better. And so suffering is really a call to our intimacy with Jesus. It brings us into a, a greater uh, intimacy with him. Now, in the Bible, it says in, uh, uh, Hebrews, uh, in Hebrews that... Um, Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Amen. Uh, let's go there for a moment. Hebrews uh, chapter, chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. That's an interesting statement that Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So suffering um, was, was, was used to get um, our Lord, you know, to, to learn obedience, 
all right? And when we're gonna look at that, that a little long, a little later on, you know, how, um, what, what, what lessons can we learn, you know, from suffering? What can we, what can we, what can we glean from our, our suffering? Hebrews chapter five, verse seven, in the days of his earthly life, Jesus offered up both, both specific petitions and urgent supplications for that which he needed Look at this, with fervent crying, who was always able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission toward God, his sinlessness, and his unfailing determination to do the Father's will. Although he was a son who had never been disobedient to the Father, he learned active special obedience. Uh, here, it, it, I believe that you know he's drawing, drawing, drawing um, from the uh, Gar Garden of Gethsemane account, where we have him, you know, uh, uh, going through great agony as he's praying, uh, you know, to the Father, and uh, and there, there through his suffering, he 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 learned. He learned obedience. Um, um, when we look at the Garden of Gethsemane account, when we look at that, it actually showed how Jesus struggled with the difficulty of obedience, but yet he obeyed God perfectly. All right. And so uh, it talked about in Hebrews, in the days of his earthly life, he offered up both specific petitions and urgent supplications. For that which he needed, look at with fervent crying and tears to the one who was all, always able to save him from death. Okay, uh, how? And he was heard, look at this, because of his reverent submission, that's obedience, submit, submitting our will to God's will, and uh, his sinless and unfailing determination. He was determined to do the will of God. And when we're determined to do, when we're determined to do the will of God, then we'll walk in obedience unto Him, right? When we're determined to do the will of God, and even though we might be going through some things, yet the determination to to be in God's will will, will override or be greater than our desire not to be in the will of the Lord. And so Matthew's Gospel twenty six, Matthew twenty six, uh, beginning with verse 36, Matthew 26, verse, verse 36. Okay. It says, then Jesus came with them to a place called, called Gethsemane. And you know, uh, Gethsemane is, is, is known as the place, the place of pressing, all right? So, you know, the whole idea was, the pressure that was, you know, the pressing of grapes, I mean, of olives to get the, the oil out of it. The, the olives had to be pressed. It's the place of pressing. Uh, he told his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, he began to be grieved and greatly distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved so that I am almost dying of sorrow. Stay here and stay awake and keep watch with me. And after going a little further, he fell face down and prayed saying, my father, if it is possible, that is consistent with your will, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And so even here, you know, struggling with obedience, yet we find that uh, uh, he didn't give in to his flesh. He didn't give in to, uh, you know, his suffering, uh, but he submitted himself unto the will of the Father, and he walked in perfect uh, obedience unto the Father, okay? And so um, Jesus learned obedience by actually obeying God, okay? 
That's how he learned obedience, by actually obeying God, all right? Uh, uh, I think it was um, uh, Spurgeon, he said something to this effect that obedience is a trade which a man must apprentice until he has learned it, okay? It's a trade that one must apprentice until he has learned it uh, because we can get it <laughs> no other way, all right? And so Jesus had to learn obedience, okay? Um, uh, by a, making the right decision, all right? When he was in the garden, agonizing, in pain, he made the right decision, not my will, but thy will be done. Uh, when we're going through whatever we're going through, you and I have to get to that place of making the right decision. Even, even if we're going through a, a painful experience, you know, we're, we're, we're dealing with great difficulties in our lives, yet we gotta make, make a decision. Obedience, is a is, it comes from a decision. We make a decision to want to obey the will of the Father, okay? And so he learned obedience by the thing which he suffered. So in reality, suffering was Jesus. And so if suffering was, was, was good enough to teach the son of God, then we must never despise it as a tool for instruction for our lives. Amen. And so, um, uh, and so, uh, <clears throat> so, even in his struggles, he obeyed God, and he obeyed God, he obeyed God, he obeyed God perfectly. Paul cries out that he wanted to know him, you know, in the power, of, okay, that he would, be a, he would be a partaker of the sufferings, and the sufferings that he's talking about is not, you know, not doing something wrong and you know, not 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 doing something sinful, but the suffering that comes from uh, uh, that comes from our willingness to allow God's will to be accomplished in our lives. That God has ordained some things for you and I to go through for our benefit. We may be partakers of that suffering that will that will cause us to come out learning how to be obedient unto the Father. Jesus had to obey, obey, obey the Father in that moment of agony, in that moment where his disciples, you know, um, uh, 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 you know, just weren't there to help him when they, when, when he needed help, okay? And so it comes, it comes down to us learning how to really trust and have obedience not in anybody else, but soul, uh, soul, soul um, confidence and trust uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ to, to carry us through. And so, um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to make this statement: with with any with any aspect of truth in our lives as followers of Jesus Christ, intellectual knowledge is not an exact parallel to exp experiential knowledge, okay? To know something and to experience something are two different things, okay? We can know what to do, but the question is, will we do what we know what to do? And some folk believe just because I have intellectual knowledge that translates into me doing what's right. No, we can have intellectual knowledge and still not do uh, what we need to do. In other words, in other words, live out that knowledge. Okay, having the knowledge does not mean we'll live out that knowledge. And so God is calling us to live out that knowledge. And so until until we know how we will react in the midst of living out a certain truth, whatever that may be, intellectual allegiance counts for nothing. All right. And so just because we may have knowledge that's not going to bring us to a place of victory or applying that knowledge to our lives. 
And so uh, it's not just having truth, but it's experiencing that truth that will allow us to have victory. And so what lessons can we learn uh, from suffering? Uh, uh, so, so testing, so testing, testing the validity of what we profess is one fundamental reason God allows suffering, all right? Testing the validity of what we profess, what we profess is why God allows suffering, all right? Now, turn with me to Job 23, Job 23, 10. Job 23.10. So testing the validity of what we profess is one fundamental reason why God allows suffering. All right. Job 23.10. He says here, but he knows the way that I take and he pays attention to it. When he has tried me, I will come forth as refined gold, pure and luminous. All right. Deuteronomy uh, chapter, yeah, chapter eight. Deuteronomy chapter eight. Don't look at verses two and three. <clears throat> and you shall remember always all the ways which the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness so that he might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and allowed you to be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, so that he might make you understand by personal experience that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. So uh, testing the validity of what we profess is one reason why God allows suffering, okay? Um, I think uh, Pastor Charles will understand this, this analogy. Uh, those that work with um, uh, diamonds or or yeah, uh, with, to test your genuineness, the genuineness of a diamond, there's something called the water test. The water test. Um, the water test is used to test the genuineness of a diamond. So, so one way to test the genuineness of the diamond is by means of what jewelers would call the water test. It's, an, it's a, uh, an imitation, an imitation stone never shines as brightly as a real one. But the contrast is not always easy to, de to detect just by ordinary viewing. So jewelers know by placing a genuine diamond and an imitation one side by side. Okay. The real one continues to sparkle brilliantly underwater, whereas the fake one loses practically all its sparkle. So the analogy is simply this. Many people who are confident in the genuineness of their faith find it lacking when they come under the waters of sorrow or adversity. The supposed diamond brilliance of their faith is then shown to be nothing but an imitation. However, Put the true, true child of God under water of a trial, he will shine as brilliantly as ever. And so, so, so uh, one reason God uh, tests us is to show, to test the validity of what we profess. Can we live out? Can we walk out what we profess out of our mouths? Okay. And so, um, lessons we can learn of, of having our, our, our faith tested or going through, going through, going through sufferings, going through sufferings, going through trials. What can we learn 
uh, as a result of that. One, we can learn the lesson of faith, okay? The lesson of faith. One reason God tests us through suffering is to test the strength of our faith, to test the strength of our faith, okay? Um, let's go to Genesis chapter 22 for a moment. We all know the story of Abraham and what he was asked to do by God. Genesis 22, uh, verses 1 and 2. It says, now after these things, God tested, there go, God tested the faith and commitment of Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he answered, here I am. God said, take now your son, your only son of promise, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Well, now, this, 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 this command that God is asking, requesting of Abraham, number one, it does not fit into Abraham's theology, okay? And I'm quite sure Abraham, being a man of faith, had so many questions that he wanted to ask God. You know, he understood that God never called for a human sacrifice from his people. That's what pagans did, okay? It was, it was the antithesis of everything that Abraham believed, okay? And so, and now, you know, why would God at this juncture in his life, almost a hundred years old, nearly a hundred years old, uh, uh, ask him now to produce a son? And then when the son is produced, he says, now I want you to go and kill your son, okay? The whole, the whole scenario, the whole idea was, was absolutely inconceivable in the mind of Abraham. God is going to challenge us to do some things that is absolutely inconceivable in our mind, all right? To test, to test the, genuine, the, genuine, the genuineness of our faith. Uh, it was a trial in Abraham's eyes that made absolutely no sense whatsoever. Uh, it, you know, um, and and the and the most severe part of this test was that God told Abraham, "I want you to kill your son." All right. Now, the interesting thing about this is simply this: how how did Abraham respond? How did how did respond? Okay. Um, Abraham revealed amazing faith in the situation. In Genesis uh, 20, 22, verse three, it says, so Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he split the wood for the burnt offering. And then he got up and went to the place of which God had told him. Okay, he obeyed God immediately, okay, without any question or argument. Look at verse five and eight. Verse five says, Abraham said to his servants, settle down and stay here with the donkey. The young man and I will go over there and worship God and we will come back to you. Verse eight, Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering so the two walk on together. Okay, he not only did he obey God without any questions and he obeyed God immediately, but he expressed this confidence that he had in God. First of all, that Isaac, he and Isaac will return. And secondly, that God will provide a lamb. Those facts suggest that deep down in his heart, Abraham knew, had, knew God's action was going to be consistent with his character and covenant, all right? So when things, when things don't make sense, when we can't, you know, uh, understand why God's doing what he's doing, one thing we can know is that God will always act, um, uh, act in a way that's consistent with his character and the covenant that he made unto us, all right? And so, um, we had that, we ought to have that 
that kind of confidence, okay? That God will act, um, yeah, consistent with his character and with his covenant with us, okay? Um, and so what we see in Abraham, this, this, this extraordinary obedience in the face of one of the most severe trials or testing that we see throughout scripture helps us today to believe that no matter how difficult the times or difficult the situation that we're in, that, uh, that God, that we can, we can wholeheartedly trust God because we know that God will act, uh, um, he will act in a way that's consistent with his character and with the covenant they've made unto us, okay? All right, and so um, what else can we learn? As we go through suffering, we can learn the lesson of faith. How genuine our faith is is our is, is, is our faith consistent with what we what we profess? Our actions consistent with what we profess. All right, and we're not going to know what we go, we're not going to know how we're going to respond or react until we get in a situation. And so it's easy to tell somebody else what they should do when they're going through something, but what about when we're going through it? Can we apply that same medicine to our lives? All right. And so uh, uh, I remember a story a long time ago. You know, uh, some of you might be too young to remember remember this guy, but uh, Shamba, you know, uh, Shamba, you know, a, a great evangelist, you know, he was all over, all over preaching. And, you know, and, and Shamba's favorite phrase was, uh, you don't have any problems. All you need is faith in God. You know, but someone said they they were uh, setting up for a service, and his son was working with him, and his son was up on a, a scaffold or something, and he fell, and they said the first thing he did was he said, call, call nine one one, get an ambulance. You know, so so you know, <laughs> uh, where was that? All you need is faith in God. So we don't we don't know what we're gonna how we're gonna respond or what we're gonna do until we're actually in a situation. Will our faith really come alive? And so the lesson of faith. The second thing is the lesson of humi the lesson of humility. All right. And so God sends trials to humble us. Okay. He uses suffering to mind us that we are not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. All right. Romans chapter 12. Let's turn there. Romans chapter 12. And uh, whoa, let me get over there myself. For by the grace of God, verse three, verse uh, twelve, three. For by the grace of God given to me, I say to every one of you, not to. Think importance and ability than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has appointed to each a degree of faith and a perfect design for service. All right. Uh, let's turn to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Here, the Apostle Paul writes, <clears throat> because of the surpassing greatness and extraordinary nature of the revelation which I received from God, for this reason, to keep me from thinking of myself as important, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment and harass me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, con concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My loving kindness and my mercy are more than enough, always available regardless of the situation. For my power is being perfected and is completed and shows itself most effectively in your weakness. Therefore, 
I will all the more gladly boast in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may completely enfold me and may dwell in me. So I am pleased with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak in human strength, then I am strong, truly able, truly powerful, truly drawing from God's strength. Amen. And so this is the testimony. This is the testimony of Paul, right? Um, he says, it was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. And so Paul was ever so mindful of the supernatural revelations that he had that he had he had been privileged to to encounter and to witness and to see in his life and to, and to experience uh, as part of his ministry. Okay, he had seen the exalted Jesus on several occasions after his resurrection, and was even received up into the third heaven. Okay, as a result, Paul could have easily have thought more highly of himself. Then, uh, then he should have, or that, or that which had been pleasing or acceptable to God. So to preserve his humility, God literally struck Paul with a very painful chronic problem. Look, it says a messenger of Satan. Okay, uh, a messenger of Satan. So that tells us this messenger of uh, this that tells us that the thorn in the flesh was 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 a person it says a messenger of satan messenger is is the a greek word angelos angelos which uh is translated most often as angel okay this word is used 188 times in the new testament and always refers to a person so as paul is writing second corinthians chapter 12 it's like he, he's likely referring to a demon-possessed man who was leading the assault uh, on Paul at Corinth. Okay, now the precise or the exact nature of Paul's problem uh, is not as important as the point. Okay, what's the point? The point that God was making to him, and not only to him but to us as well, when we are blessed, when we are, you know. Uh, being used by God, uh, God will sometimes deem it necessary to allow Satan's messenger, messenger to batter us, to keep us humble, okay? To remind us that we have no strength apart from him, okay? Some folk believe that what they're doing, they're doing in their own strength. They're doing because of their own, their own ability, their creativity, their intellect, whatever it might be. Whatever we're doing, we're not doing it because of what, what, what powers we have. We're doing it because of his grace in us, that he's using us. And without the strength of God, all of us uh, would be weak. He is the one who enables us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that gets in the power maybe of God and not of ourselves. He's the one that enables us. Without his enabling, without the grace being provided unto us to enable us to do what God called us to do, none of us can do it. But after, but we got, we, we got to be careful that we stop thinking it's us, okay? No, it's not us. It's the Christ who works inside of us. Uh, and so, uh, so Paul, Paul pleads to him. And God said to him over and over again, gets up, said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. And so Paul says, most gladly now, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, he says, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. Look at this. For when I am weak, then Christ is, Christ is strong. When I am weak, Christ is strong. When I am weak, Christ is strong. And so, so, so the reality is that God will allow us to go through 
for some challenges and tribulations to make sure that we stay where we need to stay in a place of humility, okay? And not, and not get in a place of pride and arrogance and boasting about uh, what, we are, what we're able to do or what we think we're able to do in our own strength, all right? The, uh, the third lesson is that of uh, the lesson of first love, the lesson of first love the lesson of first love. Uh, the Lord will test us to show us the object of our first love. Oh, do we really love God the way we say love, we love God? Is he really numero uno? Is he really one in our lives? And so he tests the, the validity of what we profess by putting challenges and struggles in our lives to really see if we really love God first. Hey, I mean, you know, most of us know, you know, Matthew 6.33, we can quote it, okay? Uh, but intellectual knowledge does not run, it's not equal to experiential knowledge, okay? We can, have the, we can have the intellectual knowledge of it, but are we really experiencing it, experience it in our lives? The Lord will test us to show us the object of our love. Deut um, uh, Deuteronomy uh, 13, yeah. Yeah, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Uh, and we'll begin with the. Uh, we'll, we'll start with the first verse. If a prophet arrives among you or a dreamer of dreams and gives you a sign or a wonder and the sign of the wonder which he spoke or foretold to you comes to pass. And if he says, let us follow after other gods whom you have not known and let us serve and worship them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and all your soul, your entire being. And so the Lord will test us to show us the object of our true affection, the object of our true love. Are we putting anything else in front of God? Are we putting anything, anyone in front of God? Is he first and foremost in our lives? All right. Go with me to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, I think we'll look at verse 26. Okay, 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, in the sense of indifference to or relative disregard for them in comparison with his attitude toward God, he cannot be his disciple. Let me it again, yeah. Uh, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, look at this, in the sense of indifference to or relative disregard for them, in comparison with the attitude toward God, can I be my disciple? And so what he's saying is, look, in comparison to your, your, your love for God, it ought to be as almost if you hate your mother and father, not that you literally hate them, but he's making the comparison that uh, your love for God should outweigh, should be much stronger than our, our affections or our love for anybody or anything else. And even, even ourselves and even ourselves, okay? Uh, the fourth lesson we can learn from enduring suffering. Remember, Paul says that I may, that I may uh, know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. God calls us into this fellowship of his sufferings, all right? And so uh, the fourth one is, is the lesson of enduring, enduring strength, enduring strength. The Lord allows suffering to develop in us enduring strength for greater usefulness, right? He allows us 
He allows suffering to develop in us enduring strength, enduring strength for greater youthfulness. And so uh, let's go to James chapter one. We're familiar with this, James chapter one. And let me verses uh, two through four. Consider it nothing but joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you fall into various trials, be assured that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance, leading to spiritual maturity and inward peace. And let endurance have its perfect result and do a thorough work so that you may be perfect and completely developed in your faith, lacking in nothing, all right? Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse, verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, just as we receive mercy from God, granting us, self, granting us salvation, opportunities, and blessings. Look at this. We do not get discouraged nor lose our motivation. All right. We do not get discouraged or lose our motivation. Drop down to verse uh, six, uh, 16, 416. Therefore, we do not become, therefore, we do not become discouraged, spiritless, disappointed, or afraid, though our outward self is progressively wasting away, yet our inner self is being progressively renewed day by day. For a momentary light distress, this passing trouble is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, a fullness beyond all measure, surpassing all comparisons, a transcendent splendor, and an endless blessedness. So we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things which are visible are temporal, just brief and fleeting, but the things which are invisible are everlasting and imperishable. And so here, Paul gives us three reasons why he endures suffering. The first one is that the spiritual is greater than the physical. In verse 16, he says, though the outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. Secondly, he valued the future over the present. He valued the future over the present. Verse 17 says, for a momentary light distress, is distress, this passing trouble is producing for us a far, for us an eternal weight of glory, a fullness beyond all measure, surpassing all comparisons, a transcendent splendor, and an endless blessedness. And the third thing is that he valued the eternal over the temporal, the eternal over the temporal. Verse 18, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things which are visible, look at this, are temporal, but the things which are invisible uh, are ever everlasting, uh, are everlasting. And so he, and that's why he could endure, uh, he could endure suffering for those three reasons. And so understand this, we've been called. The Bible says through much tribulation, we enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, First Thessalonians chapter three. Uh, yeah, First Thessalonians chapter three, it says three verse three, so that no one would be unsettled by these difficulties to which I have referred, for you know that we have been destined for this as something unavoidable, unavoidable in our position, all right? And so we've been called to be a partaker of his, of his sufferings. Philippians 1.29 says, we have been, for you have been granted 
the privilege for Christ's sake, not only to believe and confidently trust in him, but also to suffer unjustly for his sake. Amen. And so, um, so we've been, we've been, we've been called to share the sufferings of his fellowship. Um, that one more scripture, First uh, Peter two twenty. Uh, I mean, yeah. First Peter two twenty one. For as a believer. You have been called for this purpose since Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you may follow in his footsteps. All right. So Paul cries out. And he's not he's not only joyous to be justified, but Paul is pursuing this whole this whole dynamic of suffering to be a partaker of the sufferings that Christ has gone through. You know, that the power of God might rest upon him in measures uh, far greater than he could ever even imagine or think. And so uh, this, this suffering that you and I experience brings us into an intimacy with Jesus. It brings us closer to him. He becomes, he becomes in a sense, more real to our lives. Amen. When, when we trust him uh, uh, as we go through to help us become more acquainted with him. Paul understood that dynamic quite well, that his, 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 knowledge of, his knowledge of God would supersede the, the, the intellect, the mental aspect, and it would really come into a place of experience. And we know that, you know, Paul suffered like no one else, you know, we, we, you know in, in shipwrecks and in fastings and in, in beats and in beatings, you know, left dead and, you know, hungered and so forth. You know, he went uh, he went through the whole gamut, but it brought him closer, closer to the Lord Jesus Christ, that he might share, partake of the sufferings of his fellowship. You know, many of us want to be conformed, conformed to him. We want to be like him. But in order for that to happen, we're going to have to learn how to endure suffering to bring us to a place of obedience, because Jesus learned obedience by that which he suffered making the right decisions in the midst of the fire, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the trials, in the midst of the sorrows, making the right decisions, honoring the Lord. And as we do that, then, then it, goes from, it goes from intellectual knowledge or just intellectual assent into, I know that I know because I've experienced this thing. And, and, that, and that's where God wants to get us, to test the validity of what we profess, okay? so. For some of us, we better be careful what we declare and what we profess, because if we keep declaring it and professing it, that's the thing God's going to test us in, that we may put our money where our mouths are. Amen. And so in, in the world, we have this saying, don't sign no check with your mouth that your butt can't keep. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so don't, 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 don't sign no word, amen, with your mouth, amen, that your, that your spirit is not willing to hold on to and keep, amen, because God will test us and try us. All right, glory to God, amen. Um, does anybody need anything uh, repeated or, clar or, or, or clarity on something? All I can say is amen. That is so, so true. As you go through your journey of life, <clears throat> And uh, you accomplish great things. And then, you know, um, upsetness come in to, to teach us whatever that trial is. And uh, one of the trials for me uh, that I'm still going through, and it's been like 42 years, it's like, when is this thing going to end? But even uh, like this morning, I was... Um, in prayer with God. And I thank God uh, for the lessons that I learned going through what I'm going through. Um, it really strengthened me and taught me how to hold on to God's unchanging hand. Uh, some days is rough, 
And some days you're just so <laughs> grateful that, you know, God is with you and, you know, he'll guide you through no matter what or uh, how your mind might even change up on you. Mm -hmm. But one thing I can say, by the grace of God, it has strengthened me. It has uh, taught me a lesson. Um, but I know, but I know that God will fix it when I don't know how. I don't know. I know what I think, <laughs> but I don't know exactly God's plan to handle this problem. But I trust him. Amen. Amen. That's what he wants to do, trust it. You know, the thing about Abraham, Amen. Abraham made some, made some, you know, he just believed that God was going to do it. He didn't know how he was going to do it, but he had this quiet confidence that God was going to do it because he understood, you know, the character of, and, of who God was and the covenant that God made with him. And Abraham talks about resurrection, and yet resurrection was never even on the map. You know, at that time, nobody had been resurrected. You know, but Abraham even had enough faith belief if God, if God allowed me to kill this boy, amen, that somehow God's going to raise him back to life. Amen. Mm. Wouldn't waver in his faith, but he was strong in faith, you know, giving glory to God. And so, mm. we, we, so it behooves us to know the character of God and know how God functions, how God operates, who he is. And then we can put our trust in that. Hey, I, it makes no sense to me. I can't, I don't understand what you're doing, but I trust in the sovereignty of God that you're mm. sovereign of my life and what you bring me to, you'll bring me through. Amen. 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 We'll come out better. We'll come out stronger if we hold yeah. on. Amen. Amen. We sure will. Amen. Uh, Can I share? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, hi, everybody. Praise oh. the Lord. Oh, hello. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, I had a question. I heard a, a man of God um, kind of teach on this. But from the standpoint of like, God wouldn't have you suffer. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> like there are a lot of scriptures. Hold on one second. <laughs> um, so my, my thought was, how do we balance kind of the, okay, so, you know, the two extremes of kind of being hyper grace and, you know, well, God wouldn't allow that. He's a loving guy. He's a kind guy between, hey, this is just my lot and I'm going to succumb to it. Because I think there is an other side where, you know, as believers, we need to put our faith into action and, and things of that nature. Um, so how do you kind of balance that, those two kind of the theologies? Yeah, I think they're two different, two different things because, you know, um, uh, yeah, when I, when I talk about you know sufferings that we go through, I'm, talk, I'm, I'm talking more in the sense of trials and you know challenges and so forth. Um, and I, we back that up by scripture, you know, uh, you know, a plethora of scripture. John talked about because the world hated, you know, this kind of the world hates you, it's gonna hate us. You know, um, you know, they did it to Jesus, they're gonna do it to us because you know we're not. The servant is not greater than the master. So if it happened to the master, it's going to happen to us. That we we are the suffering that comes about because we're in opposition to this world. You know this 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 <laughs> ideology that the world that the world continues to um, propagate. And so uh, because we're going to have a different worldview, it's going to bring us into you know uh, struggles and contentions and so forth. So I'm talking more or less, you know, those kinds of, those kinds of suffering. Jesus suffered not just for suffering's sake. He suffered because he was obedient to the will of the Father. And as we are obedient to the will of the Father, you know, we're going to go through suffering because there's some things that God, that God can only work through us, work in us, is by is, is through suffering. 
you know, endurance and patience, as James talks about in James chapter one, you know, uh, you know, let patience have its perfect work that you may be, you know, entire, lacking nothing. And so, uh, but the other, the, the flip side of that, I think you're talking more about, you know, sickness and uh, things of that nature. Well, the reality is that we're not exempt from that either as believers, okay? You know, and so that's why Paul looked at it from this perspective, not, I'm not looking at the, not just at as the present, but the future. I'm not looking at what is temporary, but what is eternal. And so therefore, you know, I know that, you know, God's going to right every wrong. He's going to, he's going to, he's going to take care of every, every issue. Now, the problem is, is he going to do it on this side of the grave or that side of the grave? And so, you know, um, hey, we got, we got people who die of cancer. There's believers that die of cancer. There's be people, believers that get Alzheimer's. There's people that get all kinds of diseases. That doesn't mean that they're not safe. They don't, they don't trust God. You know, we're, we, we, we live in a world that is, that is, you know, that, it, that, it, you know, that is flawed, that is, that is, that is, that is cursed. And so we're going to, some, you know, I like what Paul says in Hebrews chapter 11. He said, you know, um, you talk about the heroes of faith and how, you know, they subdued mountains and, you know, and, and how they brought back their, uh, women brought back their dead to life and so forth. But then he said, but others suffered torture, saw, saw the thunder, you know, and they were, um, they were uh, destitute and so forth. So everybody, everybody just like, you know, the whole thing is, well, we ought to be, we ought to be, we ought to be you know, rich, you know, live like King's kid. Every believer is not going to be rich. It's not God's will for every believer to be rich, you know, right. uh, you know, so, you know, so I think we need to realize just because we're saved does not mean that we're not going to face some of the things that the unsaved, but the only difference is that we have a hope. You know, Paul comes about, I'm not looking at which is temporal. All this stuff we go through in this world is temporal. But we look at that which is eternal. And that's what, and that's where our hope is. You know, we're looking at the long haul. We're looking at, you know, uh, at at the end. And so people have, people have committed suicide. People have backslid because somebody told them they shouldn't suffer. Somebody told them that, you know, um, that was the devil that allowed, allowed your 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 loved one to die, whatever. And and that's and that's and that's and that's a shame because you know I don't think they have a, a good understanding of the sense of the scripture. And so. Uh, but what, what God has promised us is to be faithful, to keep us and sustain us. And, you know, and, and we do win. You know, we, we are going to win. You know, whether we win now or win later, we're, we're going to win. And so um, uh, I think that kind of theology has hurt too many people. You know, people have left the church backslidden because they thought they should live in a mansion. They thought they should drive a, you know, a, a, a Rolls Royce and, you know, a Bentley and all that kind of stuff. Because, you know, that's what, you know, that, that part. Paul says, I, I did not shun to declare the entire gospel unto you. So we can't just pick and choose that which we like, like we're going to a buffet. You know, I'll take this or take that, but I won't take that. But the entire gospel. And so, um, so that's how I look at it, you know. So my my bent is more on the trials and challenges of life that we go through, as opposed to, you know, the heavy stuff like sickness and cancer, dementia, and all that kind of stuff, you know. Because the reality is that um, it makes it doesn't make a saint less a saint because they have Alzheimer's or de dementia, or whatever. You know, um, the, this this is life. This is life. And so um, I hope that helps you. Yes, thank you. Um, the, the man of God that was preaching was talking about, like you said, we're pretty much, you know, if you just read your Bible and then just stay in obedience, <laughs> like you're not supposed to suffer. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I mean, he was adamant. <laughs> like I got 182,000 scriptures and I'm like, but I think that's equal part scriptures that talk about suffering and what it produces as well. So it was interesting, but thank you. You know, Paul said in Hebrew chapter, chapter 10, he said, some folk died not receiving the promise, but they believed it. Amen. And right. so, uh, you know, so, you know, we're going to believe God all the way. I mean, am I going to pray for somebody's healing? Yes. Am I going to pray for somebody's you know, healing from sickness, infirmities? Yes, I am. But uh, but but 
we have we have on record too many. I mean, you know, they say, well, you shouldn't get you good, you shouldn't get sick. Well, Paul left, Paul left, um, I, don't know, I forget who he left, but he left somebody at my leader because they were sick. You know, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're even, you know, in the Bible that it tells that people that were sick and some didn't recover. And so, I mean, hey, the reality is we don't live just in this world. Okay, we are eternal beings. And so we don't look at the temporary, we look at the eternal, all right? And we're short-sighted if we just have hope in this world. For us as believers, it, you know, life transcends this earthly life. And I think we need to focus on that. And that's why Paul can say, all things will work together for our good because we love God according to his purpose. He talked about what has happened in the past, talked about what's happening in the present, what's happening in the future, and he draws this conclusion that all things work together for our good because we love God, and, 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 and it will. You know, um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Apostle Ricks, you know, he, when this guy was at, a, when I was at uh, in, in New Jersey, and he was preaching the same kind of message. You know, you shouldn't be sick, and, you know, if you're sick, you know, you don't have faith and all that kind of stuff. And Ricks looked at me and said, that Negro... He he wearing glasses and telling everybody else they ought to be they ought to be they ought to be, <laughs> they, they, ought to be they ought to be whole. You know what I mean? So if if that's the case, then why are you wearing glasses? You know what I mean? So I think we, you know, we get off into a, a place where we're just not making sense anymore. You know? Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, somebody saying something. Go ahead. Praise the Lord. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yes. Okay. Now I can't hear you. Praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> I um, can't hear me. Go ahead. Praise the Lord. Can you hear me? You oh, are very, you're to muffled. share something with everyone. This morning, after we got off the prayer line, I went and got my little poodle and I dressed her up. I grabbed the bag and went on outside to walk her. Yeah. You, you're very, you're very muffled. We can't, we can't understand you. It's, you're very muffled. It's lagging too. Is it any better? That's better. No. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Could you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, this morning I went out, praise God, thank you, Holy Spirit. This morning I went out to walk my poodle after we got off the prayer line. When I got down to the corner, another I saw another dog looking at me. I saw him jump the fence, jump the porch. So I immediately grabbed my poodle by the time this dog had got directly you were talking about right then i looked up at god i said jesus you're my present help i knew i had the already given power and authority to rebuke this dog in the mighty and matchless name of jesus the christ and tell him he we, lo we lost you again Stopped immediately and looked me in my face and went the other way. So that to me was a test. I believed in my heart. I believed with everything in me that I already have the power and the already given a power and authority 
do. Plead the blood of Jesus and turn him around. And in the name of Jesus, right then, right on the spot, there was nothing else that could be done but to plead the blood of Jesus. And it worked. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Because he was after my poodle. She was going to be much meat pie. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It yeah. worked. Hallelujah. You know, um, I remember being young in the Lord and everybody was saying, you've got to suffer. you got to suffer. And I'm like, oh, my God, I don't want to suffer because I always associated suffering with how Jesus suffered the crucifixion, you know, being young in the Lord. So thank you for talking about the various um, uh, ways that we be tested through love, through humility, you know, um, that brought a lot of clarity, you know, to the acts of suffering or the, mm -hmm. the test of suffering. Mm -hmm. Because it is what you experience, mm -hmm. you know, and experience, like you said, you started off saying it was one of the best teachers. It is the best teacher, what we go through, yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but I think that's what happens when we first come to the Lord. And back in the day, you know, and that's what we had been taught. Oh, you're going to suffer. You're going to, you got to suffer. You got to I'm like, oh, my God. But as we go through tests and you pass that test, there is another one. There is another one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, it's, and it's designed to conform us into the image of Jesus. Yes. You know, we will never be conformed to that image if we're left to ourselves. If we can just do what we want to do, call the shots in our lives, live the way we want to live, we will never get to that place of conforming to the G conformity of Jesus. You know, it's, it's, it's part of God's plan for our lives. You know, it was a part of God's plan for his, for the life of Jesus. So, if, if we're heirs and joint heirs, come on, then we inherit that as well, you know, but I think sometimes we look at suffering as something that's bad and, you know, um, you know, yeah, bad, but it's not always, suffering is not, it's not always bad, you know, there's, you know, there's, we might look at it a little next week, you know, you can have joy in your suffering, you know, you can rejoice in your suffering, you know, you don't have to be down and out because you're going through you know, the joy of the Lord is still our strength, you know, and so to test the validity of our faith, do we really, can we really rejoice in the Lord always? Come on. Uh, how, do we, how do we know that? How do we know that? We're going to be, we're going to be tried, you know, with some difficulties because it's always, it's easy to rejoice if everything's going, going my way, but what about when things aren't going my way? And so that's to test the validity of our, do we have genuine faith or not? And so, and so uh, some things we go through uh, are designed by God, you know, to, 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 to test how genuine our faith really is, okay? You know, how can I say, you know, I love, I love everybody, you know, if I'm not going to be dealing with unlovable people, you know, that, you know, I, you know, I got to, you know, in order to test the validity of my love, I got to, I got to deal with all kinds of people. And so, hey, if I'm just, I'm, if I'm just dealing with people who love me back, who say nice things to me, who give me gifts, you know, who's always doing great things for me, that's not a real problem to my love. But what about the cantankerous person? What about the one who, you know, who doesn't like you, you know, who wants to do evil against you? You know, so, so in order for us to be conformed to the image of Jesus, we got to deal with those situations to really show what's inside of us, or not show what's inside of us, but let come, let come out what's inside of us, you know? And so, and so it's not, so, so testing and suffering and trial is not always a bad, it's not a bad thing. It's really a good thing because Paul says, I want to know him, you know, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable even unto his death. And so I want to be like Jesus. If that's our prayer, if that's our desire, then you better get ready. You're going to go through something. Amen. Because Jesus learned obedience. That's a powerful scripture. To the thing which he suffered. All right? To the thing which, and, and the Bible says he was tempted in all points, just like you and I, yet without sin. All right? And so we're going we're gonna to miss it. We're going to fail sometimes, but Jesus never failed. And so when, when, when he, he becomes our supreme example, how to, how to submit to the 
submit to the will of the, will of the Father. Yeah. Pastor, about a week ago, um, when, I was in, when I was in prayer, I was starting to confess some, some scripture and um, that nothing will separate me from, from his love and, um, and other scriptures. And that day, that whole week, <laughs> I had one thing after another, after another calamity at work, trucks breaking down, equipment breaking down, people freaking out. And at first, I did not react well. Mm -hmm. But when I realized, the second day, I realized that I was being tested. Wow. You know, and, and, and so it really caused me to turn the whole thing around. And even though things kept happening that week, that week was like, it was bad, but, you know, I was able to, you know, take it in stride and not let it steal my joy and just praising God through the whole situation because everything did work out. Everything did fall together, you know, but at the time it was, it was difficult. It was very difficult. Hey. Oh, I can say, be careful what you ask for, because you just might get it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. Let, let, let me read this script. Something came to my mind as you were talking. Um, uh, Paul said it this way, Romans chapter 5. Um, through him, verse 2, through him we have we also have access by faith into this remarkable state of grace in which we firmly and safely and securely stand. Let us rejoice in our hope and the confident assurance of experiencing and enjoying the glory of our great God, the manifestation of his excellence and power. And not only this, but, we, but with joy, let us exalt in our suffering and rejoice in our hardships, knowing that hardship, distress, pressure, trouble, Patience uh, produces patient endurance. Let, in, let endurance, proven character, spiritual maturity, and proven character, hope, and confident assurance of eternal salvation. And so, um, and so you know, the Bible talked about also, you know, um, uh, how, uh, you would, Lord, give me patience. Well, how do you get patience? <laughs> well, you get patience through tribulations. That's suffering. That's testing. Amen. You can't get patience, man. I, I learned a long time ago. I stopped asking God for patience. You know what I mean? Look, I, look, because, yes. then, because then, and, and then, then when tribulation starts coming, you start crying. You start rebuking the devil. Devil, you're alive. No, no. You ask. God has just answered the prayer. Giving you what you, if you want, patience. Then you got to have tribulation. Tribulation working with patience. Patience, right. experience, experience, hope, and hope make it not a shame. Because the love of God has been shed in the heart by the Holy Ghost. You know, so hey, uh, hey, look, I just I just want to be patient now. I don't ask for patience. I just, I just, <laughs> yeah. I just want to be patient. Yeah. Amen. Because wow. you're gonna learn obedience by which you suffer. Okay. You ask Amen. for patience, it's gonna come through <laughs> through through suffering and through trials. And how, how else can you get it? You know? Amen. Amen. Hey, uh, uh, Bishop, I, I just want to say that I don't know if you had, you had touched on this earlier because I, I missed a little bit of I had some distractions in the background. But, you know, one of the things that I thought about was, you know, uh, we that they will know you by their fruit. And I was thinking about the fruits of the spirit of love, joy, peace and long suffering. And it was just interesting to me that, you know, when you said about, you know, how are you going to know you truly love if there's no suffering to go along with it? Or how are you going to have real joy if you don't have any suffering to, you know, uh, to, to, to have something to balance that off of? And then peace in the middle of a storm or trouble, you know? Uh, so it was just interesting that that was part of the fruits of the fivefold spirit, which we need to suffer. You know, and, you know, the fact that even suffering, you know, and I know that even in the fruits of the spirit, everything has a little bit of order that that came before even faith, mm -hmm. you know, so that was just interesting to me. So, you know, I thank God for the message that sometimes, you know, we want the blessings of God, but we have to realize that we got to go through the same, the suffering as well, you know. That's right. That's right. You know, hey, look, as a, as a pastor, you know, um, and being in ministry, you, you, 
I, I, I had to be part of a service where a baby was 10 months old and died. So what I, what I, what do you tell that parent? They died because, because you sinned, you know, because, you know, that, that was, that was the devil. I mean, you know, sometimes we don't even use, we don't even use good common sense, you know, instead of trying to comfort somebody, you know, we're bringing a greater burden, putting a greater burden on them, you know? And so, and we're not, the other thing, we're not God, you know, you know, we're, we're not, we're not sovereign. We don't know. We don't know what what God is, how God is working, and what God is doing, you know. Um, and not that God allows everything, but God does permit whatever whatever happens, you know. And so, and so, some things are demonic. Some things are are, um, you know, from the pit of hell. But everything's not from the pit of hell. I mean, you know, life, life, life happens. Okay. We're not, we're not, we're not, we're not born to live forever on this earth. You know what I mean? So, so, so what happens? Hey, look at it. Look at it. After a while, some of you are still, still young. Wait till you get past 40. All right. Wait till you get past 40. Watch your body, watch your body, watch your body change. You know, I know that's right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh Yeah. Yeah. Watch it. You you can, more. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can you can repeat that. <laughs> Amen. You know everything else, but the, natural, the decay of your the reality is when we're when we're born, we start the process of dying. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes. We don't start living. We start the process of dying. Mm -hmm. We don't really start living until after we die. That's mm -hmm. when we begin to live. All right. So you're going through, this body is going through the process of dying, decaying, and one day, one day, this body is going to expire. It's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Okay. And so you can you can rebuke the devil, and you can see <laughs> the blood and everything mm -hmm. else. It's appointed on the man who wants to die. And after body, that, you know, yes. Death, death is not. You know. You know. Sometimes. Sometimes I, I even say this, God, thank you for waking me up this morning. You know, and mm, I know, that's like, right. as, Amen. If, as if I didn't wake up, I was gonna have a bad body. You know, if I didn't wake up, I'm going to glory. Amen. You know what I mean, that's I understand right. that we want to be with our family, we still want to have more time, but it's not like we lose if we don't wake up. Mm. You know, it's not like you know, uh, <laughs> you know, we got a bad deal, we don't wake up. <laughs> if we don't wake up, we're gonna be in glory. Mm. Okay. Amen. 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 Yes. So, Thank you, Lord. But we, we need to understand that, hey, we don't start living until after we die. Amen. 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 That's good. Amen. Amen. That's very good. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Well, praise the Lord. Um, he's conforming us to yeah. his image. Yeah, it's image and likeness. I want to. I want to be like him. If Me that too. Means, you gotta go through it. Yes. Amen. Me then too. Go it. Jesus did it, and he's our, he's our, he's our, our, our Amen. So, Amen. Amen. All right. Any questions, comments, any more before we close out? Pastor, yeah, they say that trees get strong by wind because they're found in areas where there's no wind, where there's no wind, and then they got wind, and these trees broke up. So brittle, but they say wind causes trees to be strong. Wow! I can see. Thank you. And guess that what that makes sense. Strong. The wind of God, the ruach. Yes. God. The the ruach. ruach. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Okay, um, Mayana. Uh, Prayer at um, 5 a.m. Las 5 de la mañana. Sí. Uh, <laughs> uh, Eglésia. Amen. Eglésia. Eglésia. Yes. Casa, casa de... Uh, <laughs> de casa Blanca. <laughs> whatever. Oh, no. Casa Blanca. Casa no. whatever. <laughs> No, no, no. Casablanca, uh, <laughs> Casablanca, no. How do you say "Household of Faith" delivers worship center in Spanish? 
casa de la herencia del Señor. Amen. Also, the prayer call um, mm -hmm. by 5 a.m. as well. Um, uh, continue to pray for um, Evangelist Annette. Amen. Mm -hmm. She's recovering. Yes. yes. Pray for um, Nick and Conrad, the loss of his brother. Pray for brother his people, Ron. the loss of her mm -hmm. sister. Amen. That God will indeed um, bring comfort and, and peace. Uh, yes. To them, uh, Brother Ron. Brother Ron, yes, uh, mm -hmm. is still recovering uh, mm -hmm. from his hip operation. And um, uh, da -da -da. Sunday, we're having communion, Lord willing. Yes, first Sunday, yeah. First Sunday. And Sister Tracy as well. Sister Tracy. Sister Tracy. She yes. said he said that. We're gonna, we're gonna pray for their hearing. They're all right. They're okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, and so um, I know Brother Conrad's brother's uh, uh, service is gonna be next Saturday, the thirteenth at uh -huh. three three p.m. at Francis. So if you're able to go and support him, um, do that. And then uh, on the thirteenth, our Boeing Fellowship. Amen. <laughs> And so um, at Winwood Lanes, all right? So any other announcements, anything I'm missing? Yeah. Yes, also on the 13th in the morning is Women of Change. Yes, on the 13th also. And uh, Armor House is on the, at the, is that the 12th, Joan? Oh. Yes, the 12th. Amen. Armor House. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, if you want to uh, donate for um, Thanksgiving um, uh, ministry, you can see uh, Deaconess Joan. Amen. And, uh, uh, they can put it in the tide and envelope and just put Thanksgiving donation. Okay. Okay. All right. There you go. Yes. Um, are the men meeting this month? Yes. Second Friday. Hello? That's the, on the 12th. That's the 12th, yes, at uh, 7. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. All righty. All right. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor, Hallelujah. Pastor, Pastor Jerry, can you close us out in prayer, please? Father God, we just thank you and we praise you, Father, for this uh, time together, a time of uh, hearing your word, Lord God, uh, just uh, coming together to learning more about you, Father God, that they that know you, we will be strong and do exploits, Father God, that we will have the same mentality of Paul, that, that we will want to know you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering, Father God, for that way they would know that our fruits by, by who we are, Father God, and you, that we will have the same character of your son, Father God, that we will be more like you in Jesus name. Father God, I pray right now that your word will be hidden in our heart that we might not sin against you in Jesus name that we will be doers and not just hearers of your word. Now, Father God, I pray right now that you would just bless these your people right now bless and keep them Father God, bless them exceedingly abundantly above all that they could access and think in the name of Jesus. We thank you and we give you praise in Jesus name. Jesus Amen. Name. Amen. 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 Amen.